Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Biologic Podcast. Today's show is episode 96, and we'll be exploring the taxonomy of the mammals. This is the final episode in the series on the deuterostome side of the animal kingdom, and it's also the final episode in this mini-series on the clade vertebrata. So far in this mini-series, every episode has covered a vertebrate clade that diverged from the clade in the episode before. So when populations of fish evolved to inhabit dry land, this would give rise to the amphibians. And when populations of amphibians adapted to drier terrestrial habitats, this gave rise to the reptiles. A particularly successful offshoot of the reptile lineage would give rise to the dinosaurs. Among the dinosaurs were the theropods, and among the theropods were the ancestors of the birds. The birds would be the only dinosaur lineage to survive the asteroid impact 66 million years ago, allowing them to radiate, diversify, and settle into the many open niches left available after the mass extinction. Well, today's episode will break this cycle. The mammals are not descended from the birds. They're actually a much older clay than the birds. The mammals descended from a group called the synapsids, which existed about 250 to 300 million years ago. These synapsids were early cousins of the proto-reptiles, which themselves emerged just a little bit earlier, about 312 million years ago. So in this way, the mammal lineage is almost as old as the reptiles themselves. They're just a few million years younger. And they're much older than the birds, whose most primitive forms emerged around 150 to 200 million years ago. This means that there was a roughly 50 to 150 million year period of time where the only amniotes in the world's terrestrial ecologies were the reptiles and the mammals. The birds just hadn't arrived yet. Now, before we move on to get into the bulk of mammal taxonomy, I want to mention a few important details about advanced tetrapod evolution. When the amphibians diversified hundreds of millions of years ago, some of them became proto-reptilian populations that were adapting to drier environments. A key development in this adaptation was the evolution of the amnion, a layer of protective tissue that surrounds the embryo, the yolk sac, and the allantoi. It's basically a water balloon environment that lets the fetus enjoy free movement and buoyancy. And critically, the amnion protects against water loss, which allows the egg to be laid in drier environments, like dry land outside of a lake or a pond or a river or a marsh or any other body of water. This adaptation marked the dawn of the clade amniota, which is a division of the tetrapod vertebrates that possesses this amnion structure in their eggs, and are thus able to colonize much drier habitats with more extreme temperatures. This amniota clade would diversify to create reptiles and birds and mammals, which all have an amnion, or an amniotic sac. Metabolically speaking, the reptiles persisted in a state of ectothermy, this means that they are cold-blooded. They have to live in warm environments where their bodies can be warmed by the sun or by lying on hot sand or soil or a warm rock or something like that. On the other hand, the birds and the mammals each independently evolved to become endothermic. They can generate heat internally because of their more nutrient-intensive metabolic biochemistry. This is a really important fitness trade-off. The birds and the mammals have a much faster metabolism than the reptiles. This means that they need to eat a lot more calories on a daily basis. But the benefit is that they produce their own heat, so they can survive colder temperatures and colonize colder habitats. About 170 million years ago, mammals had also evolved furs, which provided further protection from the cold. The titular feature, no pun intended, of the mammalian class are their mammary glands. All mammal species have these fluid-producing glands, which are typically located along the chest and belly. It's theorized that the initial purpose of the atavistic mammary gland 
was to secrete a fluid to keep the eggs moist. Remember that the early amnion would not have been perfect right from the start. It developed and improved over time, but at the start, in the early stages, it might have needed an externally applied liquid coolant to survive in a dry, hostile environment. Perhaps the amnion originated as a dry layer that could be wetted and then would hold on to the fluid, whether it be milk or water, particularly well, and it wouldn't evaporate as quickly. This would have been an advantage. It would have kept the egg moist a little longer than eggs that didn't have this advantage. From this initial starting structure, it's pretty intuitive to see how it could have been adapted or evolved into a more watertight, sealed layer that contains its own inner buoyant layer of water. Anyway, over evolutionary time, the mammary glands would evolve to produce a nutrient-enriched fluid, which would become milk, and this could then be fed to the newborn offspring. This physiological relationship between mother and offspring, where the mother needs to quite directly feed the offspring from the mammary gland, uh, feed this nutritious fluid that she's produced, this sets the stage for their social and psychological relationship. And by this, I mean that mammals also evolved intimate and complex parenting behaviors. The birds also evolved to closely parent their young, not because they have mammary glands, but because the chicks are just so calorie-hungry that they need more food than they could possibly catch on their own, so their parent must provide. Mammal offspring are also very calorie-hungry, which is why having a nutritious food source immediately on hand is such an advantage. You can see how all of these defining mammalian traits, from fur to mammary glands to endothermy, are all interconnected, chemically, physiologically, and behaviorally. Alright, so with that brief crash course on the big mammalian evolutionary developments, I think we can go ahead and get started with the actual topic of today's episode, the exploration of mammal taxonomy. Of all of the vertebrate clades that I've talked about in this mini-series, the mammals are by far the smallest. The most primitive vertebrates, the fish, including the jawless fish like the lampreys and the hagfish, are easily the largest and most biodiverse clade of vertebrates, with close to 33,000 known species. The amphibians were also once quite diverse, but they've been declining in number for a long time now and in the modern day, there's around 7,300 extant species. The reptiles and the birds are both similarly large and biodiverse, with around 10,700 and 10,400 species, respectively. And lastly, the mammals, the humble mammals, only have 5,500 known species. The most primitive and basal lineage branching off of the stem mammalia are the monotremes of the order Monotremata. Compared to every other mammal species, these primitive creatures are tiny little weirdos. They have mammary glands, but they're so primitive that they still lay eggs instead of giving birth to live young. The only monotremes that still live today are the aquatic platypus, Ornithorhynchus anatinus, which is the only surviving species of its family, Ornithorhynchidae, and three species of the more terrestrial spiny anteaters, or the echidnas, of the family Tachyglossidae. The second most basal mammalian clade are the marsupials, whose most characteristic feature is a pouch on the mother's belly, where the young offspring can be carried and protected. Within the marsupialia infraclass, the most primitive groups are the opossums of the didelphidae and the Cenolestidae families. Another primitive group is the microbiotheria order, which has one lonely species still in existence, the very tiny, nocturnal, arboreal, South American Monito del Monte, also known as the Colocolo opossum, Dromysiops glyroides. An intermediate marsupial order is Diprotodontia, which is a relatively diverse group including the single koala species Fasciolarctos cinereus of the Fasciolarctidae family, three species of wombats of the Vombatidae family, brush tail and pygmy possums of the Phalangeroidea superfamily, 
the ring-tailed, feather-tailed, and honey possums, and the various types of gliders of the Pteroidea superfamily, the rat kangaroos of the Pteroidea and the Hypsoprimnodontity families, and most charismatic and well-known of them all are the wallabies and the kangaroos of the Macropodidae family. Aside from the monotremes and marsupials, all other mammal lineages belong to the clade Placentalia. You might think that this is because they all use a placenta, but this isn't exactly the reason, as there's, uh, there's marsupials who have placentas too. It's just that the mammals of Placentalia simply use their placenta more. They have longer gestation periods, whereas the marsupials have significantly shorter gestation periods, and they compensate by keeping their fresh offspring in the pouch on their belly. It's kind of like nature's equivalent of an incubator for a premature baby. The mammals of Placentalia don't have pouches, because they just keep their babies gestating internally for a longer period of time. Within the clade Placentalia, there's three major divisions. These are the Xenarthra, the Aphrotheria, and the Boreoeutheria. Of these three divisions, the Boreoeutheria is the largest and the most biodiverse. Next is the Aphrotheria, and the Xenarthra is the smallest. So, uh, for the rest of the episode, I'm going to be covering the Xenarthra first, and then the Aphrotheria, and then we'll get to the large and very biodiverse Boreo Eutheria. Alright, so with that being said, the Xenarthra includes a small collection of strange and unusual mammals, divided into two orders, Singulata and Pylosa. The order Singulata contains all of the armadillos, which are really curious mammals with armor-like shell plates. They can hunker down or curl up into a ball, so their shell protects their soft body parts. Singulata includes the family Clamophoridae, which are just your regular armadillos and glyptodonts, like the fairy armadillos, the naked-tailed armadillos, the hairy armadillos, the giant armadillo Priodontes maximus, and the dwarf armadillo Tolaputes trisinctus. And Singulata also includes the family Dasapodidae, which are your long-nosed armadillos, like the, the non-banded armadillo Dasapus novemcinctus, and the hairy long-nosed armadillo Dasapus yepesi. Now the other Xenarthra order, Pylosa, includes the anteaters of the Cyclopedidae and Myrmecophagidae families, and the sloths of the Bradypodidae and the Megalonychidae families. The Bradypodidae family includes the three-toed sloths, and the Megalonychidae family includes the two-toed sloths, as well as the now-extinct ground sloths. All of these creatures in Xenarthra are just, they're fascinating cryptic weirdos. I already mentioned the armadillos, which, alongside the pangolins, are unique among the mammals for their shells. The anteaters are interesting because of their particularly long, toothless snout, and their even longer, ribbon-like prehensile tongue. Both the anteaters and the sloths have large, curved claws, but they use them for different reasons. The anteaters use their big, curved claws for digging and breaking apart logs and other stiff media that might contain delicious insects. The sloths use their claws like hooks for hanging onto tree branches. The sloths are named after their weirdest feature. They're remarkably, almost dangerously slow-moving creatures, with slow metabolisms. Their metabolism is actually much more like a cold-blooded reptile than other warm-blooded mammals, which is why sloths engage in behaviors like sunbathing and this general lifestyle of slow movement to conserve energy and stay warm. The sloths creep and hang around in the trees, where they spend all day, every day, basically, patiently eating leaves. The sloths are so slow, in fact, as they move across branches and crawl from tree to tree, that various species of green algae are known to grow on their shaggy fur coats. This algae offers camouflage for the sloth, because it tints them green and makes them look like some kind of giant patch of moss hanging off of a tree branch or hanging on the, the trunk of a tree. And this gives them a kind of passive defense against large South American predators, 
like jaguars that might want to tear them out of the trees and eat them. That's about it for Xenarthra. These are strange, somewhat primitive mammals with many weird qualities, but they're quite charismatic and lovable. I mean, kangaroos, sloths, wallabies, uh, all of these animals are awesome. They're really cool, but they're also so strange. All right, moving on. The Xenarthra are closely related to another major division of the class mammal. They're closely related to the Afrotheria, which is, as the name suggests, a lineage of mammals that lives in or originated from Africa. Within Afrotheria, there's two major lineages. You have the small insect-eating creatures of the Afroinsectophilia and the Penungulata. In the Afroinsectophilia, there are five families, representing about 57 species, give or take. The most primitive of these families is the Erectoropodidae, which has a single genus, Erectoropus. And within this, there's just a single species, Erectoropus afer, also known as the Aardvark. The next most primitive Afroinsectophilian family is the Macroscalididae, or the jumping shrews, or the elephant shrews, also known as the sengi, as they're known in the local Bantu languages. These small rodent-like creatures have long noses, hence the name elephant shrew, which they use to sniff out and hunt down various bugs. Larger prey animals, like earthworms, can pose a real challenge for them. They have to wrestle the earthworm into the ground and prevent it from burrowing away and, and escaping. And while they're wrestling with it, they have to gnaw it into smaller, bite-sized pieces. An intermediate group within the Afroinsectophilia are the golden moles of the Chrysochloridae family, endemic to southern Africa. These stubby creatures are well-suited to a life spent digging and burrowing. They're blind, their ears are reduced to mere holes in the side of the head, and they have broad paws and strong shoulders for shoveling away dirt. Curiously, their kidneys are remarkably efficient, to the point where they can get all of their water from their food. They don't actually need to drink liquid water at all, because they just get it all from their food. The most derived groups of Afroinsectophilia are the otter shrews of the family Potomegalidae and the Tenrex of the Tenrecidae family. These families are closely related. The three species of otter shrews live in rivers and lakes in sub-Saharan Africa, where they, they chase their prey through the water. The tenrex, endemic to Madagascar, are a larger clade that enjoys much more biodiversity. Where the otter shrews are largely aquatic carnivores, the 31 species of tenrex are omnivores, and they've adapted to a much wider range of terrestrial habitats. The short-tailed shrew tenrex, Microgale brevicaudata, for example, lives in tropical forests along the northern coast of Madagascar. The greater hedgehog tenrec, Cetifer setosus, and the tailless tenrec, Tenrec ecaudatus, both live in a variety of dry habitats, like uh, grassland, scrubland, and savanna, as well as in developed urban areas. The highland streaked tenrec, Hemacentites nigriceps, lives on the ground, burrowing in foliage for food and the mole-like rice tenrec, or Rizorictus hova, largely spend their time underground, digging for worms and other hidden treasures. Alright, so, as you can see, the Afroinsectophilia are almost entirely small, insect-eating creatures that resemble shrews or moles. There's just not that much biodiversity here. The most unusual creature in the clade is the aardvark, and its unusualness primarily comes from its relative primitiveness. It's one of the more basal clades among Afroinsectophilia. But if we jump over to the other Afrotherian lineage, the Panungulata, these species represent a much more diverse range of habitats, of behaviors, and morphologies and physiologies. The most basal Panungulata lineage are the Hyraxes of the Procaviidae family. These are also small, shrew-like creatures. They're chubby and stout, thickly furred, and possess short limbs and short tails. They're herbivores, and they live on rocky outcroppings, where they can stay nice and warm, 
and where they can run for cover if a predatory bird or some kind of jackal or something comes by. Interestingly, one of the closest relatives to the chubby diminutive hyraxes are the elephants of the family Elephantidae. This used to be a group that was once much more abundant and much more diverse, but the spread of predators, particularly humans, has devastated their population numbers over the last several thousand years. And in the modern day, there's just two major elephant lineages that are still around. These are the African elephants of the Loxodonta genus, which includes the African bush elephant, Loxodonta africana, and the African forest elephant, Loxodonta cyclotus, and the Asian elephants of the Elephus genus, which technically includes a single species, Elephus maximus, that's spread across a pretty wide geographic area and can be further divided into subspecies, based on where each population lives. For example, the population on Sri Lanka are known as Elephus maximus maximus. The Sumatran elephants are Elephus maximus sumatranus. The Elephus maximus borneensis live on the island of Borneo, and the Elephus maximus indicus live across the Indian subcontinent. Now I want to take a moment to fawn over the elephants, because these are seriously some of my favorite creatures. Not only are they beautiful and unique animals, with a long prehensile trunk that they use for everything from moving around debris to searching for food to a snorkel for when they're wading through deep water, but on top of this, the elephants are also amazingly intelligent and empathetic. They have complex cultures. They play and goof around. They're self-aware. They have long memories. Their communication has an above-average complexity. They use tools, and they seem to have an understanding of death, as they mourn lost loved ones, and they show a peculiar interest in the bones of their dead. They're truly incredible animals. Now let's move on, as there are two more families in the Penungulata lineage. These are the Trichecidae family, which includes three or possibly four species of manatee, and the Dugongidae family with just a single living species called the dugong, scientific name dugong dugon. Another species of dugong, Stellar sea cow Hydrodamalus gigas, was hunted to extinction in the 18th century. Now all of these animals are large, peaceful aquatic herbivores that mind their own business feeding on seagrass. They're very calm, placid animals, not prone to violent outbursts or attacks, but Unfortunately, this has made them very easy prey for humans. They're often killed by accident when they get hit by boats. Alright, so we've covered the basal mammals. We've covered Xenarthra and the closely related Afrotheria. So that leaves just one more mammal clade, the Boreoeutheria. This is also the largest mammal clade, with the most biodiversity by far. Now usually I'd start with the most basal group in the clade, and then I'd work my way up to the most derived groups. As I describe Boreoeutheria, I'm actually going to skip the most basal lineage, and start with the second most basal lineage. I'll come back around at the end of the episode to look at the most basal lineage, and hopefully, then, you'll see why I organized it this way. So, without further ado, the second most basal Boreoeutherian lineage is the Eulipotyphla order which includes the Arenaceidae family of hedgehogs and relatives. The Selenodontidae family of Selenodons, which are weird, shrew-like creatures that are known for having mammary glands on their butt and venomous saliva. There's the Talpidae family, which includes all the Desmonds, moles, and shrew-like moles. And then lastly, there's the true shrews of the Sauricidae family. All of these families represent small, fuzzy, ground-dwelling creatures. They live in the underbrush, scurrying through tall grass and leaf litter. Many of them will dig through the soil, sometimes creating just little humble burrows, or in the case of the moles, they'll create sprawling networks of tunnels. The next mammal lineage, the third most basal, is the Chiroptera order, also known as the bats. This is a huge division of the mammal clade, containing over 1,400 species. 
around 20% of all mammal species, so about one in five, are bats. There's about 20 families of these flying mammals, and I'm not going to go over all of them in extreme detail, but some of the more charismatic or noteworthy groups include the primitive Pteropodidae family of megabats, or fruit bats. Then there's the Megadermatidae family of false vampire bats, the Rhinolophidae family of horseshoe bats, the Natalidae family of funnel-eared bats, the Phylostomidae family of New World leaf-nosed bats, and within this, the infamous Desmodontini subfamily, which you would recognize as the vampire bats. The most derived groups within Bordeo Eutheria belong to two lineages, each of which are incredibly biodiverse in their own right, and they make up the majority of the Earth's large mammalian megafauna. These clades are the Euungulata and the Fairy. Alright, so let's get started here with the Euungulata, which represents all of the hoofed mammals. Hooves are the tips of the toes, consisting of a rubber sole encased in a keratin-rich sheath of nail tissue. As these animals walk around on their hooves, even though the tissue is quite stiff and strong, naturally they're going to endure a lot of wear and tear. The hoof is ground down by the terrain, by the rocks and the, the sand and, and everything else, and so the tissue has to grow continuously. All euungulata, with one significant exception, have hooves. Some of them have an odd number of toes, while others have an even number of toes. And while this might seem like a really trivial and unimportant difference, it's actually the basis of a really big division within the clade. It's a really important physiological feature that helps define the two big ungulate groups. The even-toed ungulates belong to the artiodactyla lineage, and the odd-toed ungulates belong to the perissodactyla lineage. The odd-toed ungulates of Perissodactyla, for example, typically have three or five toes, with the middle toe being the weight-bearing one. The Perissodactyla includes three families. You have the Equidae, the Tapiridae, and the Rhinoceratidae. The most familiar member of the family Equidae are the various subspecies of the horse, Equus ferus. The family also includes three species of wild donkey, Equus africanus from Africa, Equus hemionus from the Middle East and Western Asia, and Equus kayang from Tibet. And perhaps most exotic, equity includes the three species of zebra. The plain zebra, Equus quagga, the mountain zebra, Equus zebra, and largest of them all, the imperial zebra, Equus grevii. The Tapiridae family is much smaller, both in the context of biodiversity and their physical size. It contains just one genus, and within that, just five species of tapirs, which are pig-like animals that live in tropical forests. Four of these five species live in the Americas, mostly in South America, and one of them, the Malayan tapir, Tapirs indicus, lives in Southeast Asia. The Rhinocerotidae family is similar in size, with just five species, but these belong to four different genera, which means that the rhinoceros are slightly more biodiverse than the tapirs, like genetically speaking. These include the black rhino, Dicers bicornis, the huge white rhino, Ceratotherium simum, the Indian rhino, Rhinoceros unicornis, the Javan rhino, Rhinoceros sondaicus, and smallest and arguably most endangered of them all, the Sumatran rhino, Dicerorhinus sumatrensis. The even-toed ungulates of Artiodactyla are much more diverse than their odd-toed counterparts. These include the camels and the llamas of the Camelidae family, the strange and diminutive chevrotains of the Tragulidae family, the zebra giraffe and the four species of tall, charismatic, true giraffes of the Giraffidae family, the various pigs and the hogs of the Suidae family, and the closely related peccaries of the Tyasuidae family. And then there's the pygmy hippo, Chiropsis liberiensis, and the much larger and significantly more dangerous African hippo, Hippopotamus amphibius, of the family Hippopotamidae. 
There's also the American pronghorn antelope, Antilocapra americana, which is the sole species in the family, Antilocapridae, and the immensely familiar bovine family, which includes all of our cows and cattle, the buffalo, the antelope, and over a hundred of their related cousins. The Cervidae family is another particularly large clade, which includes some 49 species of deer. Related to them are the seven species of musk deer of the Moscidae family. The biggest species of deer, and by a large margin, is the moose, Alces alces, known in the boreal forests of Eurasia and North America for their large heads and noses, their long legs and knobbly knees, and on the males, their distinctively broad-plated antlers. Perhaps the most unusual branch of the Artiodactyla are the cetaceans, which are aquatic mammals that have evolved to replace their legs and hooves with flippers. Their evolutionary story is really fascinating, as their amphibian ancestors crawled from the sea. Their reptilian and mammalian ancestors adapted to dry land, and their immediate cetacean ancestors were basically a mammalian version of a crocodile that eventually fully transitioned back into the sea with a fully aquatic lifestyle. The cetaceans include the whales, such as the large humpback whale Megatera novaenglia, and the mini slender backed rorquals of the Balaenopteridae family the gray whale Escherichtius robustus of the Escherichtiidae family, the greater right whales of the Balaenidae family, and the closely related pygmy right whale Caperia marginata of the Cetotheriidae family. Then we have the sperm whales of the Cogeidae and Physeteridae families, the beaked whales of the Ziphidae family, the river dolphins of the Aeneidae, Platanistidae, and Nodoporeidae families, the porpoises of the Phocinidae family, the beluga whale, Delphinopteris lucus, the narwhal, Monodon monoceros, of the Monodontidae family, and, most charismatic of them all, the playful, intelligent, and only occasionally dangerous dolphins of the Delphinoidea family. So to summarize the essence of the Uungulata, the odd-toed ungulates include the horses, donkeys, zebras, tapirs, and rhinos and the much larger clade of even-toed ungulates includes the camels, the llamas, the giraffes, the hippos, the antelope, the deer, the cattle, pigs, buffalo, and all of the whales and dolphins. All of these groups together make up the Uungulata, which is one of the two most derived clades of Boreo-Eutherians. The other one, the second of these most derived clades, is the fairy. And make no mistake on the name, that's not referring to, like, fairy tale fairies, it's referring to feral, like feral animals. The fairy are a feral clade overwhelmingly represented by carnivores, by meat-eating predatory beasts equipped with all manner of fangs and claws. A primitive branch of the fairy is the order Folidota, with a single family, Manidae. Within this family are the pangolins, which are strange anteater-like mammals covered in keratinous scales, which can be found all over sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeastern Asia. Now aside from the pangolins, the rest of the fairy clade belongs to a massive order called the carnivora, which are, as you might have guessed, carnivores. Carnivora is a massive clade, although most of its species, which represent most large mammal predators that have existed for the last six million years, have gone extinct. The remaining carnivorans can be divided into two suborders, the caniformia, the dog-like carnivorans, and filiformia, the cat-like carnivorans. Within the caniformia, the family canidae represents the most basal lineage. These are the foxes, the wolves, and their domesticated cousins, the dogs. Closely related to the dogs and the foxes and wolves are the bears of the Ursidae family. Now, I've always thought that bears were pretty hardcore animals, but realizing that they're basically the huge, pumped-up, hyper-dangerous evolutionary cousin of the dogs and the wolves somehow makes them seem even more badass. There's a healthy variety of bears, including the giant panda Aelorapoda melanoleuca, 
the sloth bear, Melursus ursinus, the Asian and American black bears, known as Ursus thibetanus and Ursus americanus, respectively, the common brown bear, Ursus arctos, and its massive Kodiak grizzly bear subspecies, Ursus arctic middendorfii, and the massive hyperdangerous polar bear, Ursus maritimes. There's two other caniform lineages. The pinnipeds, which includes the walruses of the Otobenidae family, the fur seals and sea lions of the Otariidae family, and the true seals of the Phocidae family. And then the other one is the Mustioidea superfamily, which includes the skunks of the Mephididae family, the red pandas of the Eileridae family, the raccoons of the Procyonidae family, and the weasels of the Mustelidae family. Just as the bears are like the souped-up, extra-large, extra-dangerous version of the wolves, the species in the weasel superfamily are like smaller, sneakier, scrappier versions of the wolves, and the walruses and seals are like the aquatic version of the wolves, adapted to life in the sea where they can chase after fish. So those are the groups of caniforms, and on the other hand, we have the cat-like carnivores of the feliforms. Similar to the caniforms, the feliforms includes a broad diversity of creatures of various sizes, suited to various habitats, but all built around the cat-like form. They all have cat-like faces, cat-like tails and claws, and cat-like behaviors. The most basal cat is the African palm civet, Nandinia binotata, which is a short, gray-brown cat that lives in the Congo Basin and in other tropical regions of sub-Saharan Africa. It's the sole species in the Nandiniidae family. In contrast, the biggest family of feliforms is the Felidae, which encompasses all of the true cats. Some noteworthy Felidae clades include the Caracals and the Ocelots, the Lynx and the Puma, the Panthera lineage, which includes the Jaguar, Panthera unca, the orange and black striped tiger, Pantheris tigris, and the Lion, Panthera leo. And of course, we can't forget the fuzzy and lovable domestic cat, Felis catus. The rest of the feliforms are represented by relatively small clades, including the viverids of the viveridae family, the hyenas of the hyenidae family, and the mongooses of the herpestidae and eupleridae families. Okay, we are almost near the end of the episode. But do you remember a while ago when I introduced Bordeo eutheria? I said that I was going to skip the most basal lineage and come back to it later. I skipped that most basal lineage and then covered the taxonomy of moles and shrews, bats, and then the even and odd-toed ungulates, and the caniforms and the feliforms. Well now, I want to go back to that most basal lineage of Bordeo eutherians, which is known as the Uarchontogleres. This remarkably diverse clade includes the tree shrews of the Tupeidae and Hylocercidae families, the hares and the rabbits of the Leporidae family, and the closely related pikas of the Ocotonidae family, and the absolutely massive Rodentia order, which includes a stunning biodiversity of animals all known as rodents. Nearly two in five mammals, or 40% of all mammal species, are rodents. Among their ranks, you'll find creatures like the porcupines and guinea pigs, the beavers, squirrels, chipmunks and gophers, and a colossal number of all different kinds of mice and rats. Just appreciate this level of biodiversity for a second. You have all of the mammals in the world, right? Every single ungulate, every single carnivore, and every whale, all of them. Of all of these mammal species across the planet, three out of five of them are either a rodent or a bat. Everything else, every other mammal that's not a rodent or a bat, represents just two out of five of every mammal. I don't know about you, but I find that to be a stunning and remarkably interesting figure. The last branch of the mammal clade that I want to cover today, the final offshoot of the most basal lineage of Bario eutherians, are the primatomorpha. These include the coligos, or flying lemurs of the Cynocephalidae family, and the true primates. The primates are a large group that includes the mini-species of lemurs of the Lemuroidea superfamily, 
the Lorisids and Galagos of the Lorisoidea superfamily, the Tarsiers of the Tarsiidae family, more than a hundred species of New World monkeys of the clade Platyrrhini, more than a hundred species of Old World monkeys of the family Cercopithecidae, the Gibbons of the family Hylobatidae, and the Great Apes of the family Hominidae. These great apes include the orangutans of the genus Pongo, the gorillas of the genus Gorilla, the chimpanzees and bonobos of the genus Pan, and the humans of the genus Homo. So here we come, at long last, across our entire exploration of the protostome and deuterostome sides of the animal kingdom, at long last we come to the branch of the family tree that has a branch that has a branch, that has a branch, that would give rise to the human species. As a human being, you are a Homo sapien, a member of a lineage of deuterostome vertebrate mammalian primatomorphic great apes, and you can trace your lineage, our lineage, all the way back as it ties into the larger tapestry of all life on Earth. This is our position in the great tree of life. And you can see, from this perspective, from this vantage point, looking back at the tree of life at all the other branches, what is most closely related to us, and how. I'm sure we all knew that humans were most closely related to the primates, like the chimps and gorillas, and, of course, uh, by extension, the monkeys. But it may come as more of a surprise that, beyond this, our closest relatives are the rodents and the rabbits. And it's also interesting to note that, as, uh, as members of the most basal lineage of Borio eutheria, we are also quite closely related, relatively speaking, to the mammals of the Afrotheria. This evolutionary knowledge puts uh, the human being in a new context, a, a biological context, that I think is existentially beautiful. Understanding the tree of life and our position in it helps us connect with nature and understand how we are a part of this larger, ongoing, superchemical process that we see around us, that sustains us and nourishes us, and that we cannot live without. I guess the takeaway message uh, that I'm trying to get at here is that we are not separate from nature. Human beings are a part of nature, a seamless, integral part of the tree of life, and this is our particular branch. I just think it's a really beautiful thing. With that, I think we've come to the end of the episode on the mammals. This is also the end of our mini-series on the vertebrates. It's the end of our main series on the deuterostomes, and it's the end of our macro-series on the kingdom Animalia. I hope you enjoyed not just this episode, but the entire playlist as we explored the taxonomy of basically all of the animals, from the smallest bug to the weirdest mollusk to the toughest reptile and the fiercest mammal. In fact, the only animals that we didn't look at in this giant exploration of the taxonomy of the animals are those that emerged before the protostomes and deuterostomes. These are animals that existed before the bilaterians, the, those animals with bilateral symmetry. I'm talking about the sponges, the anemones, the tenophores, and the jellyfish, among other ediacaranodides. Don't worry, though. We are far from being done with the animals. All of these episodes on protostomes and deuterostomes were just focused on their taxonomy, on exploring their abundance and biodiversity and a little bit of their evolutionary history. In the upcoming series, we're still going to be looking at animals, but now, instead of their taxonomy, we're going to be looking at their physiology, their life cycle, their behavior, and their ecology. I won't be describing phylogenetic trees and rattling off lists of scientific names, Rather, we'll be learning about the ways that these animals hunt or parasitize their prey, how they avoid predators, how they attract and compete for mates. We'll learn about their reproductive process, their life cycle, including metamorphosis or stages of puberty, their diet and social behavior, their mimicry, camouflage, tool use, their evolutionary history in much greater detail, and all sorts of other awesome details about each animal group. And on that note, we're going to dig deeper, taking a much closer look at more specific animal groups. For example, in the previous series on the protostomes, we spent one whole episode exploring the mollusks, their, their taxonomy. But going forward, 
there's going to be an entire series on the mollusks, with episodes on the physiology and life cycle of more specific clades, like gastropods and cephalopods. We also spent an episode exploring the enormous taxonomy of the insects, but going forward, there's going to be multiple series on the insects, with episodes on the physiology and life cycle of specific clades, like the dragonflies of Odonata and the beetles of Coleoptera. We spent an episode exploring the taxonomy of the reptiles, but going forward, there's going to be an entire series on the reptiles, with an episode on crocodiles, and an episode on snakes, and an episode on turtles, and so on and so forth. There's going to be a lot more content, too. A lot more stuff that extends beyond the animal kingdom entirely. The biological world is enormous. It's nearly infinite in its diversity and complexity. Our exploration of the biological world has really only just gotten started. But you'll just have to stick around for that. Give this video a like or a 5-star review. Hit the subscribe button for more awesome biological content and to help me out in the algorithm. Check out the Patreon page if you want to support the show. And as always, thank you so much for listening.